Well, I'm going to talk today about the uh, the Abhidhamma. It's a bit of the early text, a bit. It's a huge hunk of the early texts that have generally been disregarded uh, by the West because they're kind of intimidating in the context in which we learn the Dharma. So I'm going to I'm going to provide uh, what I think of as like a trailer for the Abhidhamma. It's going to be uh, just not even quite an introduction, but it's going to be a gesture towards the Abhidhamma with an effort to try to see how we might use it in our practice. Um, it's a it's it's a bit of literature. One of the reasons that it's so intimidating is it's just lists. People um, don't really understand. Let me just show you. Uh, this is the first uh, page of the first book. The Abhidhamma is seven books long, and this is basically what you get. Just lists. There are no stories in the Abhidhamma. There's another a section from another place, matrix, matrices of dyads from the discourses. So when we look at these things, this is another place from another book, the good in relation to the sensuous universe. What are the states that are good? And then look at, it's just a list. It just goes on and on and on. So it's, it's been pretty intimidating for Western practitioners. <clears throat> and, um, but as you can see, it's set up for, to be almost like talking points. And in fact, that's, that's what it was. Now, when the Buddha died, um, there was a council that arose a few months, three months after the Buddha's death. Um, traditionally, there were 500 arhats who met and they spent probably seven or eight months uh, reciting and trying to memorize the, the teachings that the Buddha had left because there wasn't uh, uh, written culture at the time. So the, the um, teachings were divided into three uh, pitaka, which are a Pali word we translate as baskets, but they're just collections. So the earliest collections, there were three. There were the collections of discourses that were addressing the ways in which monastics should live. There was a collection of discourses, the Nikayas, which contained the suttas uh, and um, stories about the Buddha. And the Abhidhamma, there's some people who suggest that uh, Sariputta was started this. But if you look at the history of uh, um, the Buddhist teachings, the earliest layers, the Sutra Napada, for example, very little systematization. If you look at the Nikayas, you start getting the Eightfold Path and the Four Noble Truths and the 37 Wings of Awakening. And uh, there's an effort to try to organize the teachings to help remember it. A lot of these numerical lists were mnemonic devices to help to help the monks recollect. And the Abhidhamma. Now the Abhidhamma, like like I say, it looks like lists. And uh, what you're going to get today is is sort of my interpretation of the Abhidhamma uh, and of some of the elements on these these lists, um, which is the way I think. My understanding is how it was used over the past 2,500 years. In monasteries, not everybody memorized all the texts, but you could memorize lists. And they were used as talking points, and they were used um, by teachers to instruct students. And they, you know, what we're looking at is something that is a, um, a map of the subjective territory that we inhabit. Um, and we're being asked to bring our attention mindfully to it. This is sort of fourth foundation of mindfulness uh, material, paying attention to the dhammas as dhammas. 
And as part of the, um, let me, since this is really a, uh, I'm going to put this, I'm going to put this up since this is really a, um, so suited for PowerPoint. I'm going to inflict PowerPoint because this is sort of how it was, how, how the uh, Abhidhamma was used. Um, so we see the three Pitakas and the Abhidhamma Pitaka. It's composed of, um, let's see, seven books. I'm not going to go through them all, but, but these are, whoops, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, the the Dhamma Sangani, which is basically like a Gray's Anatomy of our internal landscape, and these these concepts are all like fingers pointing at the moon. We're not supposed to reify these fingers. We're not supposed to be staring at the fingers. We're trying to look at where they direct our attentions. So these subsequent uh, the description of individuals. Uh, points of controversy. You can find these materials um, on the uh, the site Suda Central. This is the the paradigm for learning that um, applies to the Abhidhamma. Sutta Maipanya, Chinta Maipanya, and Bhavana Maipanya. Sutta Maipanya refers to hearing the teachings from a teacher or from a book, reading them, hearing them, learning what the, what the teachings are. Chinta Maipanya is the process of contemplating them, meditating upon them, exploring them in our mind. And Bhavana Maipanya is the, <clears throat> is the um, process of cultivating the teachings in our life. So we have the, the three Pitaka, which is, like I say, are going to be lists. And, and um, these lists are to be understood, I think, as a meditation guide, not as a description of the world, not as a metaphysical map. So a teacher might say, and I'm going to give you an example here, a teacher might say to his, his student, Come back tomorrow and tell me the difference between reactivity and response. So think about what you might say for a second. If you were to try to distinguish between response and reaction, then note what your mind does. It goes to your experience, tries to recall, to make some to articulate some distinctions. So this is the way the Abhidhamma is presented in a teaching situation. Um, and it became a personal thing between the teacher and the student. You know, as monks would go one way or another and spread out, that they would try to te take all the teachings with them. And the Abhidhamma would be the way it was done. Now, by the time we got to the third council, uh, which was trying to keep track of the Buddhist teachings and to find resolution to doctrinal differences that had arisen, there were traditionally, we understand, 18 schools of Buddhism, of, uh, and the Theravada was one. And each of them had their own Abhidhamma. So there are differences among them, and this reflects differences as teaching devices, not differences as metaphysical, <clears throat> metaphysical realms. So this meditation map uh, for us consists of four dhammas. Now the word dhamma uh, here just refers to the things that can be perceived. These are the, these are considered the 
the four realities. Now, if you ask whether they're metaphysically real, I mean, is there really the five senses? These, these kinds of questions are sort of beside the point. But we can look at these four dhammas as uh, the subjective, subjective states, rupa, and we can identify them in our experience. Rupa, the five senses. If you can see colors, that's rupa. Can you feel your butt on the chair? That's rupa. Sound, any sound present? That's rupa. So the five senses are an experiential reality. This is sort of the philosophy, the organizing understandings of, of the Abhidhamma. So there are five of those critters. And then there's chitta. It's the word that we translate as consciousness. Um, you know, this is a, this is a situation where, where we articulate um, consciousness into, well, in some, by some counts, 80 different mind states, and by other counts, 120 different mind states. These are attempting to, let me just, um, this is a page from a handout that you're going to get that uh, will, it's a bibliography. This is Andy Olensky's collection of the states of consciousness in the uh, Theravadan Abhidhamma. And some of them have to do with jhana states and formless spheres and co states of consciousness that are that are uh, formed by uh, karma and some that are uh, response to external. Um, so the idea would be over a period of years, one would, during long periods of meditation, learn to articulate, um, learn to recognize states of consciousness uh, that are present. Consciousness in the Abhidhamma is, um, the word is, is often a vinyana, which means uh, divided consciousness. Consciousness in the Abhidhamma always has an object. Uh, it's consciousness of something. The notion of pure consciousness or empty consciousness, these, this would be uh, not, these aren't teachings that occur in the, uh, in the early texts. Um, so this is uh, also one of the, the skandhas. For those of you who are familiar with, with the skandhas, the skandhas is a uh, typology uh, that the Buddha used to describe our subjective experience. Um, there are five elements there. One is rupa, which is the five physical senses. Um, there would also be awareness, consciousness of feeling tone, we're going to find this in the Abhidhamma too, and then consciousness of perceptions, sanya, you know, perceptions are interesting. If you, if you can pick your face out uh, among all the faces on this screen here, um, that's a process of, of recognition, of perception a distinction of something amidst the uh, colors and shapes and that you you recognize it uh, all the kinds of recognition that our mind does with our sensory data would be sanya so we have rupa we have sanya we have the feeling tone of each moment these aren't processes. These one of the one of the ideas in the Abhidhamma is that we're talking about mind moments, each moment uh, separately. So each moment has a feeling tone, and it's pleasant or unpleasant, or people say neutral, but it's tricky to find. Let me just suggest a way of of, uh, of accessing Vedana, which is this feeling tone. Skanda. Uh, when you go to the doctor and the doctor says on a scale of zero to 10, how is your pain? You're able to do that, right? 
before you can do that. Um, it's not a precision measure, but it is actually a, a, uh, a measure of a mindful moment where you assess your, your unpleasant condition, but you can also use it for pleasantness. So if I were to ask you on a scale of zero to 10, where would you place vanilla ice cream? For me, it sort of hovers around a six or a seven. And, you know, a baked yam, a buttered baked yam, maybe a three or a two. Still good, not bad. If you put the two scales together from a minus 10 being the most agony, most unpleasant, to a plus 10, which would be the most ecstatic moment, with zero being meh, you can have a scale that measures the Vedana of any given moment or any given object that you bring your attention to. You know, can you, you can, and you can, you can actually be more precise than you think on this scale. How are you feeling at the present moment? Pleasant, unpleasant, probably, maybe it's going to be not too far from zero. We are not in a rush of pleasure. And most of us are hopefully not feeling terribly uncomfortable, but you could be a minus one or a minus two if you're physical or plus one. See, just notice where you are. My wife noticed one, one time that uh, if she brought her attention to some discomfort, that if she paid attention to it might be a minus two or minus one and a half. And then as she brought her attention to it, it changed. So we can actually track the feeling tone. And if you bring any object to your mind, like vanilla ice cream or, well, just for example, the two past presidents, you can probably have, find different feeling tone, you could measure your feeling about each of them separately. They're probably different. So Vedana is uh, uh, an important object of, of consciousness. And then there's uh, the Sankaras, which are our, our impulses, our volitional impulses. And this is what we're going to spend a lot of time with, working with the Abhidhamma in a little bit. Um, these would be in this, the four Dhammas, among them would be the Chitasakas which are generally, usually the word is translated as mental factors. But aside from these uh, skandhas, which we've just talked about, aside from them, um, we're, um, most of them are all volitional impulses. They're sankaras. So you, the, um, and there are, 52 of them. You saw the list of consciousnesses. Um, there were 50, Andy Olensky's, uh, he describes the Abhidhamma as how 28 physical phenomena, so Rupa is broken into 28 physical phenomena, co arise with 52 mental factors manifesting as 89 types of consciousness, which unfold in a series of 17 mind moments governed by 24 types of causal relations. So this is what the, this is what the Abhidhamma is, is an articulation and incredible granularity of the same kind of material that we study when we approach uh, dependent origination and try to come up with some clear understanding of the actual mechanics of Dukkha. This is the value of, of studying the Abhidhamma as it gives you uh, an intimate uh, uh, points to the intimate aspects of uh, the mechanics of dukkha formation in ourselves. Let me just, before we move on, let me say something about Nibbana, which is the fourth uh, of these experiences. So you can experience, you can directly experience Rupa. You can directly experience chitta, consciousness. You are aware. There's awareness happening moment by moment. 
and the Chattasakas. Each, each moment brings with it some bit of intention, and we're going to look at a whole range of them in, in, in a little bit. And then Nibbana is considered the unconditioned Dhamma. It's a, it's a direct experience. The Buddha talks about experiencing it here and now. But it's the experience of uh, the absence of what we call greed, hatred, and delusion. There are three three concepts uh, that the Buddha the Buddha um, advanced. The three fires, uh, and we translate them as greed, hatred, and delusion in a kind of a shorthand way. But there are actually spectrum words that are pretty important. Uh, the word lopa, which we translate as greed, refers to the whole range of wanting experiences from very subtle wishing preferences to wanting to longing to uh, passion to obsession it's the whole range of wanting experience we translate that briefly as greed dosa is the the whole range of unpleasant experience there's no words parallel to these in English. So uneasiness, just the, we don't like it. We're, there's aversion to it. We don't like it. Uneasiness, maybe irritation or frustration, maybe anger or rage uh, or fear, all of the aversive responses, um, dosa. And then moha is the uh, the word that, that uh, we translate uh, as delusion, some people translate like prefer confusion. Um, it's very, it's similar to avijja or ignorance. It just occurs in, in a different context than avijja. But Nibbana is described by Saraputta in the Samyutta Nikaya as the destruction of greed, hatred, and delusion. So the destruction so that it's it doesn't arise again, which is a pretty tall order, but we do have each of us individually we have experiences there's a wonderful article that you can find online by Buddha Dasa Bhikkhu. Um, there's dozens of PDF versions of it on, all over the place it's titled Nirvana for everyone and he's saying that you know we experience moments of cessation neurota moments of cessation of greed hatred and delusion where longing isn't present aversion isn't present and we're not clinging to beliefs of the way things are these come and go nibbana would be a um considered a the destruction of the tendency to give rise to greed, hatred, and delusion. And so it would be um, an unconditioned element in that sense. It's experience unconditioned by greed, hatred, and delusion. Nibbana in, in the Abhidhamma is not a thing. It's an experience, um, an experience of constantly unbinding or not being tricked into clinging but each moment arises independent nibbana isn't a state conditions change pleasant experience all of a sudden our experience is unpleasant and the ability to navigate that with equanimity uh, would be the skill that the Abhidhamma and the Buddha is talking about, the ability to uh, attenuate and reduce and put an end to, to a dukkha. So the root, the root to Nibbana in the, in the Abhidhamma would be in the conditioning of the kusala um, mind states. We're going to talk about we're going to talk about the chitasakas, mind states. We're getting into lists. 
my wife says, everybody's going to be dizzy from the lists. <laughs> because right now there's only three items on it, but you can see where we're going. Um, there are uh, these mind states that accompany consciousness. There's a, a metaphor that, uh, you know, consciousness is the king and it always comes with an entourage. And the entourage is the constellation of chitasakas that come with it. Consciousness is the knowing of something and the chitasakas are the way in which the mind uh, uh, relates to the known object. And at the heart of the Abhidhamma is skillful and unskillful, ethical. The ethical dimension is at the heart. And by ethics, I don't mean, uh, and I don't think that the, the Buddha meant right or wrong, uh, or even true or false, but by ethic, by ethical, the ethical dimension, I think he's c concerned with the, um, the realm of dukkha, the experience of dukkha and the cessation of dukkha. So acts that enhance unpleasantness and pain for ourselves and others would be unskillful actions. Those intentions and actions that lead to the cessation of dukkha would be skillful. And then there are some that are ethically variable or neutral. So we're going to go through these. There are 52 of these suckers, and um, we're going to we're going to take them up and see about working with each one of them, um, because these are fingers point. Like I say, fingers pointing at the moon of our experience. The Akusala factors we're going to study separately, and the Kusala factors. These the word Akusala translated as unwholesome or unskillful. And by that, we mean they make things worse. You know, they add more dukkha into the mix. There's plenty of dukkha already present in the, on the uh, dependent origins and origination concept. We've got, you know, the first noble truth is just a list of unpleasant and painful experience, birth, aging, sickness, death, pain, sorrow or sadness, distress, lamentation and despair, not getting what you want, getting what you don't want and losing what you care about. That's, the, that's on everybody's dance card. That's the first noble truth. The second noble truth is we usually make things worse. We add to it aversion reactivity, uh, anger. So we're going to start by, by taking a look at the ethically neutral factors. We just, let me just show you a, uh, this is what they're going to look like. You don't have to read the small print. We're going to make them big. I just, this is a slide that's just trying to give you a sense of the whole realm, the ethically neutral factors. There are a whole bunch of unwholesome mental factors, and these uh, are expansions on more, more uh, articulation and depth of the, uh, uh, the second noble truth of greed, hatred, and delusion, upadana, and then the wholesome factors. So we're going to start by, by considering the ethically neutral factors. And this is what a chart of them would look like. These are all arisings uh, in the mind. The first seven of these on the left are called universal neutral factors. They are present in every moment of experience, which means we can feel them now. We can experience them now. And as we go through, we're going to take a look because you they're here they're present in every moment. The, the first the first bunch of them, I think whoops yeah so we talked about the skandhas here, so the first the first bunch here rupa feeling tone vedana, sanya 
which is the perception, the ability to recognize and uh, make sense of things, uh, vijnana, consciousness, and sankara. So we'll see here, pasa. These are the universe, these arise in every mind moment. And they're ethically neutral, contact. We're talking about uh, uh, consciousness of uh, our physicality. If, you, if you're talking about contact with the five senses, you're in the realm of rupa, the skanda of rupa. And if it's contact with a mental recognition, Asanya, we're talking about uh, contact, consciousness there. Vedana is feeling tone again, and we've, we've, um, we've described that and what I think of as the Vedana meter, which um, measures, makes, makes uh, some kind of an objective uh, marker for our, our feeling tone. Sanya, perception, always, every moment there is, there is the mind making sense of things. You can watch the mind do it sometimes when you hear a sound and you go, what is that? And the mind struggles to, to create a, a, a sanya, and that's, that struggle would be chetana, which is the word that's, that uh, we describe as volition. So these, these first four plus plus Chitta, which is consciousness and is a whole other dharma. These are the dharma, the dharma of, uh, of the chitasakas, of the mental formations, the mental factors. They may give rise to dukkha or lead to a sensation. Volition is, is uh, depending on what the volition is, if it's, a, if it's some, a, an intention of kindness, it will be different than if it's an intention of anger. So it, it's ethically neutral in that sense. Um, ekagata, which is described often as um, single pointedness. It's a friend of mine, uh, we were talking about it the other day, used the word focus. So in, the, in any moment of consciousness right now, your attention is focused, one-pointed, you could say. This is a jhana factor and becomes, uh, uh, as a practice technique, you can uh, make it, uh, make, keep the mind very still and very focused. Right now, the mind you know, flickers from one moment to the next. When we think, and it can flicker like uh, these mind moments. In the Abhidhamma, the mind moments are like frames on a motion picture, which flicker by so fast that you see uh, objects in motion, even though each it's a series of mind moments. So our, our attention, our focus can shift quickly. We can be thinking of, we can be experiencing uh, two different things or separately and flickering back and forth and we think of them as happening both at the same time in our mind. This is a um, primitive delusion. But focus is one aspect of every moment's experience. And just check it out as you as you go through your day. The Abhidhamma is useful day to day. Javindir, Jav, Javitindriya. This is a, a faculty that this is not in the Sarvastivadin Abhidhamma. So does it exist? Is, is it a reality? The idea is not to make some kind of metaphysical reification here. The idea is to see what it's pointing at. And it's pointing at the, the feeling of being alive. It's the difference between a fresh corpse and a living being. It's the life force, Bergson's life force. It could be, uh, we can feel it. If you take a moment to just bring your attention to your body, you can feel energy. So this is present in every moment. 
and attention, Manasakara. So Manasakara is um, the quality of um, Manasakara is tr it's it's consideration. It's it's not just that there's mind is focused, but it's attending to. We're paying attention to. Um, a particular object or a particular aspect of experience. These things are not separate in our experience. We're, we're separating them for the purpose of, you know, pointing at these aspects of our, of our subjective landscape. But all of these things should be, should be present um, in the, in the four, I, I mean, in the present moment. Now the universals, like I say, these are always present. The occasionals, what we call the occasional, sometimes the particulars, um, occur sometimes and not at others. They occur in different constellations, different uh, um, different combinations. I'm going to go through these, and we'll see if we can um, identify them in our in our experience. Vitaka, which is some of you may recognize as one of the jhana factors. Um, it's it's often uh, translated as initial application. I think of it as intentionally directed attention. So you can be sitting in a daydream, mind just floating from one thing to another. And then something happens, maybe there's a flicker in the corner of your eye, and you bring your attention to something, to that flicker. It's the process of directing your attention. Chetna, volition, we bring our attention to something. It can be whether this is um, wholesome or not, depends on the object, whether, the, whether this particular directing of attention somehow enhances suffering or attenuates it depends on what the object of attention is. But it's the difference between the mind just, you know, monkey mind just going from one thing, one thing to the next. In the, in the practices, this is um, thought of as a way of overcoming sloth and torpor in our practice. Bring your attention back to the breath intentionally directed attention. This is sometimes, not always. Vichara. Vichara is sustained attention. It's, it's uh, usually translated as sustained application. But this is keeping your attention on an object. These are also jhana factors, and my experience with them, my contact with them for years, was only in the context of jhana teachings. But this occurs in your day-to-day -day walking around life. You can you can follow this in your day-to-day. -day. So sustained application, vichara, keeping your attention, whether it's wholesome or not. You know, a sniper would be keeping his attention focused, sustained attention. Not wholesome, not skillful, not leading to the cessation of dukkha, but sustained attention nonetheless. When we go to study something, right now we're, we're bringing sustained attention to the Dharma in the various ways that the Abhidhamma reveals it. It's, um, 
an investigative factor, you know, the factor, the second factor of awakening, investigation. This is, this is the realm of vichara. Sometimes, you know, sometimes, but not always, right? So there are times when the mind sort of drifts or it, it, it goes from one thing to another. You know, when you're driving and, you know, you're just checking your mirrors and intentionally directing your attention in several different different ways to make sure what's going on. But all of a sudden, some car is swerving crazily and the chara, right? You know, sustained attention. These are things to notice in our in our day to day. Vitaka and vichara, forms of attention. Attention can be skillful or unskillful. Vitaka can be skillful or unskillful. Vichara, skillful or unskillful. Adimoka. This is, um, I think Andy translates it as decision, but resolve. Sometimes there's there's an intention to stick with something, to keep it in mind. Adamoka is probably present now. You might notice it in your you know, your intention to to maintain focus on what's going on. It's not always present. Sometimes the attention can wander. You know, if you're at a sporting event, your attention can drift from one thing to the next. You'll pause as you watch a particular player. You know, these, and then maybe you want to find out something about uh, what's this player's background. And there's resolve as you bring your attention to your phone and you do your little Google. Virya, energy, uh, also uh, strength. Uh, it arises often with commitment because uh, it's the third factor of, of awakening, the energy that, that shows up from interest. You know, if you're looking into the background of a player, for example, or an event or looking into a location on your phone, why do I think phone? But if you're, you know, uh, there's energy, right? You can, and there's sustained attention. Averia is, uh, it arises with, with commitment. Um, it's one of the perfections in the Mahayana tradition. Um, Piti, which is described as the light. I, I, it took me quite a while to come to an understanding of Piti, which, as I say, these are, well, I'm sharing my understandings here. It's translated when it's being presented as, as one of the um, jhana factors as rapture. And so it feels sort of not in my experience, rapture. I'm not sure what that means. The rapture has all kinds of connotations of, you know, Christian theological planning. But it's, it's trans, I think Andy translates it as zest on the chart that, that you can find in the, in the handout that will be uh, that, um, Rob will post to the chat function at some point and, and will be mailed out after. I think Andy translates this as zest, but it's, but it's also, uh, um, it's linked to energy. It's that moment for me, you know, the aha moment. It's a satisfaction moment. It's, it's um, delight. Ah, yes. It's that moment of, um, well, you could say rapture, but it's the delight from the, that arises from doing a task creatively. You discover something new. 
And you know what I mean? It's that it's satisfaction. You've accomplished something. You know what I'm talking about? It's a it's an experience that you can distinguish in your own mind. You can recollect it. And by the way, the recollecting of of uh, things is is a is a mindfulness practice here. You know, the uh, the Buddha suggests the recollection of 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 various things as a mindfulness practice, even things that you have to imagine, the elements of the body, for example, in the first foundation of mindfulness, you know, has you imagining uh, internal organs. We can, he encourages us to imagine working our way through a bush of thorns and trying to avoid being stuck. Uh, and in this, in that case, he's talking about being stuck by pleasant experience and grasping at it. He's using it as a metaphor. So, so mindful, mindful attention, um, you can recall experiences of piti. It can be unstable, you know, it comes and goes, not always present, but sometimes even something simple. Why do I, why does the traffic metaphor come up for me again? But you know, when you make it across three lanes of traffic in time to get to the, you know, there can be not just relief, but a little bit of, yeah, I did that, you know, maybe. But you can find in your own experience, uh, examples of piti, of delight, uh, of satisfaction. And then desire, the last of these is desire. Chanda, the word is Chanda. Now Chanda is, uh, is translated as desire. And there are, there are a lot of different words in Pali, in the Pali language that are translated as desire, that we just gloss as desire. It's sort of like they have the number of words for desire as Eskimos have for snow. And we, we've got one word, which is desire. But desire is, in this case, it's an ethically neutral factor. Uh, Dhamma Chanda, the desire for the Dhamma, would be skillful. Kama Chanda, the desire for sensual pleasure, is one of the hindrances. It's the first of the hindrances. So we can... Um, sometimes see desire arising. You know, some of these things light up really well um, uh, in, in imagining pleasant experience. So, you know, you can imagine yourself at a mall and you can see desire arising. I remember walking, the reason the mall comes to mind is because I remember being at a mall and walking behind a couple of uh, teenage uh, girls, one of them was saying to the other, I know I want something, I just don't know what it is. But oh, yeah, I've had that experience. You're thumbing through a catalog. There's sort of some desire to come across something that you'd like, you know what I mean. Um, so desire is ethically, ethically variable. So these are the these are the ethically neutral impulses in the mind, the chitasakas. The universals occur in every moment. The occasionals arise and pass almost like uh, instruments in an orchestra. Sometimes they're all playing, sometimes just one or two. Does this all make sense? Let me uh, let me take, pause for a minute here because before we move on to the uh, um, impersonal, I mean these are all impersonal. There, these things arise without an ego, without an agent. I think one of the underlying principles behind the uh, Abhidhamma is the is impersonality. Um, so if you, I guess the way to do the um, questions, I'm not sure we can do it while the, the screen is being shared, but there should be a reaction 
thing at your bottom, you can put up a hand. Is that there for you guys? If somebody has a question, why don't we do that? And I can, uh, these things make sense or questions about context, history, um, and these, these ethically neutral variables. Gail, please. And you have to unmute yourself. Two small points. Uh, when back, just for clarification, when you were talking about Vinyana, back up when we were in the cheetah section, yeah. and I believe you said it's divided. Yes. And um, you mentioned object, and I wondered what the other part was. Oh, that's the 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 awareness, the consciousness. So the Buddha talks about consciousness as a sense object a sense organ oh the organ and when there is contact wow. there, is, there is consciousness at that sense gate so in our experience and you can check it out there is eye consciousness right there is hearing consciousness there is tactile consciousness right you can feel it right now yes um taste and and smell maybe not so much at the moment these are all occurring and then there's contact at the the mind sense gate which would be the perceptions sanya would be the contact at the mind sense gate and that sanya can in, can include itself sanya it can include um, vedana and it can include sankaras yeah I had one other just clarification when you said when you were talking about the um the universal factors uh the question of life faculty mm -hmm. you mentioned that it was not in the sarvastivadin abhidhamma right does, does that mean the Theravadan abhidhamma or what exactly what why did you say sarvastivadin <laughs> is it well is because it i said all of the, uh, each of the traditions had their own Abhidhamma. Right, but I, what I'm looking for is sequence, because I came across something that said that the Abhidhamma was not, didn't, didn't exist in the first council, it came later, and I'm just trying to stack things up in my mind. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, how does well, that- Well, the Abhidhamma kind of developed, it, it developed over time, yeah. If, as, as some scholars think, Sariputta was the, the one who thought it up, um, you know, there would have been people working with it, even at the first council, even if it weren't formally collected. I see. You know, because because as you work in monasteries, some, some poor Ajahn may have a good sense of the Dharma, but doesn't recall all of the suttas that the Buddha recited. Right. You know, and um, some people memorized some of them and some people memorized others. And the Abhidhamma was a way of, of keeping track of all of them, even in a situation where you didn't have all of them memorized. Right. So they would have been, they would have been shared between teacher and student uh, this way. Um, just as, you know, like I said, you know, can you distinguish in your experience between Vidika and Vichara? And when you can, you've become mindful of an aspect of your being, of, of the process of, of living. And, and the underlying reason to study the Abhidhamma is that it gives you a chance to see in much more granularity. Right mechanics of dukkha formation yeah thank you sure anything else about uh all of this is completely clear i guess <laughs> there's a huge amount to work with here and the abhidhamma working is to look at this and look at the fingers as if these are fingers, um, 
see where they're pointing. So the Sarvastivadins weren't pointing at the life faculty. Is the life faculty something that exists? Is it a reality? That's sort of, like I say, beside the point. Can you, is it, is it something that you can distinguish in your experience? Well, you know, we don't really have the contrast of its absence. And from the other side of it, we could add a bunch more, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yes. Yes. You know, it's when you're sitting there trying to come up with words to describe an experience, you're doing what the people with who formulated the Abhidhamma were doing, which was trying to uh, articulate that, that inner experience, mindfulness and clear comprehension of the comprehension part. Um, okay. Anyone else questions about about these? Or I can't see the whole. Uh, I only have a, a window that has a partial number of of you. So, if there are any other hands, okay. Now I'm going to move along to. Um, the Akusala factors and things get juicy here. So this is, we're, we're in the context of the Chittasakas, which are the mental factors that accompany consciousness. When we come to the Akusala factors, this is the realm of the second noble truth. And if you, if you look, I think we've got greed, hatred, and delusion here. But we also have a lot else. So there's a, like I say, there's a lot more granularity here to our, our perception of upadana, the grasping that uh, are the unskillful uh, techniques, mental, mental techniques, mental applications that arise. So in every and, and I'm going to compare some of these with what are called the beautiful factors. So I'm, I may shift back and forth at a couple of places. Um, but there are four universal factors, unskillful factors that arise with delusion. Delusion is the, every, every Akusala formation in it uh, has moha in it, every unskillful formulation. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's described as flowing from the distortions of perception. We see permanence where there is no permanence. We see, we see uh, the possibility of satisfaction. That will make me happy. If I got that, I'd be happy. That's the delusional expectation because, you know, in in the the uh, series, um, Mad Men, Don Draper, who's the ad man, described described happiness as the moment after satisfaction and just before dissatisfaction again, before wanting more. So these things arise and pass. But delusion is at the heart of every unskillful moment, every moment in which these factors are arising. Delusion is, is tricky um, because in some ways, um, what is not delusion? We think something simple like the sky is blue. That should be pretty clear. But you know, blue is not some property of the sky. It's something that arises in our neurology, right? Some people with uh, retinal damage might not perceive blue, and then is the sky blue? And there are there are a small number of uh, women, a small percentage of women who have four cones in their retina. So they perceive 
four different red, yellow, and blue, and something. We can't know it unless we've got that. So would a sky be blue to them? They would recognize it is the color that's labeled blue, but it's not an attribute of the sky. And then what is the sky anyway? Is it a thing up there? You know, if you go up there, what, what do you find? The sky. I mean, is that the sky? So is the sky blue? Well, it's a phrase we use that's useful. It helps us keep track of things. You know, the winter is cold. It's a description of our reaction to the winter. But when we attribute those qualities to the thing itself, the last of the Vipalas is, is seeing beauty in what is inherently neither beautiful nor not beautiful. I try to get my dog to look at the sunset, but she's really interested in what's going on under a bush. I say, it's beautiful. Look at the, look at the clouds, look at the colors. And she she is more interested in the, the fence the fence post. So what is beautiful is about us. When we project it onto other things, when we say the oh, the world needs this, the world needs that, it's a projection of our own uh, wishes, our own preferences. Moha comes, and this is the cognitive distortion. The next two elements are the ethical distortions. And they're really important too, because they're always uh, present in, in every unskillful moment. So I'm going to talk about Ahirika and Anotapa. These are a preview of the Kusala universal phenomena. So in skillful moments, there's always sati. Mindfulness is at the heart. And moha is at the heart of their respective collections. The satis, where sati is present, there is skillful uh, intention. When moha is present, unskillful. And we, these, are the, these are the cognitive sides. The ethical sides have to do with ahirika and anotapa which are the absence of hiri and otapa. I want to talk about hiri and otapa a little bit because, oh dear, you, if you've heard about them, you may have heard that they are the guardians of the world. Um, but they're, they're translated, I just, you know, I'm, they've translated as moral shame and moral dread. Is that helpful? Moral shame and moral dread. I just, it creeped me out for years. You know, and it, I, I mean, really, it does not feel good. But really, what you're, <laughs> you're talking about, uh, here is, a, is conscience. You can experience conscience. It's, it's a caring thing. Um, it's, it's what restrains you from you can feel it if you imagine hitting a baby. You 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 just cringe at it, don't you? You just you you have, you you have moments in meditation you can't have helped but come across recollections that arise during meditation of things that you've done that that are cringeworthy. Anybody missed the cringeworthy stuff? You know, and you just go, oh, I can't believe I did that. And then there's more than one. And you go, oh, I can't believe, I can't believe that. What you're feeling there, that's the feeling of hearing. It's the feeling of conscience, of caring. It's 
It's an internal recollection. It's, it's the ethical side. It's the, the heart side of, of these um, elements. Now let me, so we've got Ahirika. That's the absence of that. We don't care. Now there's, we just don't care. That's what Ahirik is about. Uh, or we're remorseless. We look back on what we did and, and we have no, we don't regret those things that we've done. There isn't even remorse about, about it. That's an absence. So Ahirika is no hiri. And anotapa is not caring. So otapa is about the external ethical dimension. It's about our relationship with others, our ethical relationship with others. And this is mediated by culture. That's for sure. Moral dread frames it as if it's something we're afraid of. But you know, otapa is a caring, you know, we walk around and we bump into each other and we try to organize in a way that we aren't always fighting over stuff. So there are, there are customs. I'll give you ex some examples. The elevator opens and you let people off the elevator before you get on the elevator, just an informal thing. You, know, you come to somebody's house and there's you, you walk in the door and there are shoes on the, on the uh, doorstep. You take your shoes off. You know, it's just, it's, uh, so I, I think of Otapa as um, caring, consideration, etiquette. You know, and it can be different. There can be in, uh, uh, I understand that in some, uh, some cultural contexts, if you're served a meal and you eat everything on your plate, the hostess or host might feel that they couldn't feed you enough. They might feel bad. But in other contexts, if you don't clear, clean off your plate, the host might feel that you didn't like the food. So what's the person to do? Understand the cultural context. You know, uh, there can be conflicts between these, these things. Uh, Otapa in our complex society is framed in terms of laws, the kinds of agreements and the ways we formally agree. Um, some criminal behavior is, is regulated by law, some by custom. You know, some of it is just the harm of Me Too and all the kinds of, you know, have you ever wished that someone learn a lesson? They, you know, wishing harm upon another, wishing unhappiness, or acting in a way that creates it. Moha, Ahirika, and Anotapa, these are, these are elements that are present. We miss, you know, when we just look at greed, hatred, delusion, we're looking, we're missing the ethical side, the side that refers to the, the creation of or the cessation of Dukkha. And the last of the universals, the universal unpleasant, I mean, unwholesome uh, factors. Oh my gosh, this is just so much material. Restlessness. This is one of the hindrances, actually. I think, I think I've got a frame where we, we talk about the hindrances are present. For those of you who are familiar with the five hindrances, restlessness. This is not being settled, not being at peace, always looking for the next thing. What's next? 
No. And the mind, of course, is disturbed by this continual looking around. I think of it sometimes as like radar, you know, on the, the a warship's got radar going, always monitoring, always checking, restlessness, looking out for opportunities, looking out for threats. A lack of satisfaction and focus and peace. When we recognize these factors in ourselves, we can recall them. This is, this is the Abhidhamma work. taking these fingers and looking to recognize these experiences. Are these all clear? Let me, let me take a moment here and, and see if there are questions before we take a, a short break. Everybody all good on this? No questions, no, no problems? Please, Joshua, you, you're muted, so you should unmute yourself. Joshua, go ahead. Yes, hi, thank you. Yes, a lot of material. Um, when you, as a point of clarification or something that I, that just came up, when you were speaking about restlessness mm -hmm. um, as a kind of radar, uh, the analogy in my mind was uh, the autonomic nervous system, which is a kind of radar we have. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I wonder so, what you think about that. Yeah. Well, so, you know, one of the things about the Buddha's teaching is um, uh, it's described as against the stream sometimes. Um, the default responses of the organism of wanting things pleasant, wanting unpleasant and painful things to go away. This is the source. This is the, the Tanha, the second noble truth. This is the source of of the uh, arising of upadana the three fires greed hatred and delusion our disposition our the way we're built and designed in the world it includes our autonomic nervous system it includes the amygdala you know the amygdala triggers if it if we perceive a threat it triggers so the question is you know there's a there's a a, a lovely story um it's Sylvia Borstein, uh, it's one of her favorites, about the, uh, the Zen master, who's in, the abbot, who's at a monastery and they, in Japan centuries ago, and they hear that the samurai are coming to town and everybody needs to get out because they threatened to kill everybody in town. So everybody leaves and the abbot stays. And the abbot's there and the head samurai swaggers into the, you know, temple and approaches the the uh, Zen the abbot and says uh, what are you still doing here don't you realize I'm someone who can run you through with my sword without blinking an eye and the abbot says and don't you realize that I'm someone who can be run through with your sword without blinking an eye how do you how do you not trigger the amygdala what kind of an understanding of the way things are of the nature of impermanence and insubstantiality, what kind of insight enables that response? You know, so there is an overcoming of the way we are, the way we're built. We're built to want things pleasant. Can we abstain from craving pleasant experience and be content with the experience that's present? We're built to try to make pain and unpleasantness go away. And usually the response to it is aversion, anger. Dosa, which we translate as hatred. But we could respond, and we'll talk about this, we could respond with compassion, doing the same thing, trying to attenuate pain, but out of caring and not out of aversion and anger. Does that make sense? So there is a there, you're, you know, you're, you're right on that. Um, 
you know, a lot of the Buddhist teachings are teachings that go upstream, that don't, you know, uh, that don't follow the, the default mode. Yes, thank you. That's very helpful clarification. And, 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 and recognizing these things is really essential to being able to deal with them. Kate, go ahead. You're muted. Yeah, um, I, the question I have, it, it, it's hard to formulate it, but um, it, it seems that um, one can practice simply noticing the present moment and what you're experiencing. Mm -hmm. And then we learn things like the seven factors of enlightenment and, you know, the different Dharma talk kind of stuff. And then there's the Abhidhamma. Yeah. It, it, am I correct in that um, this is just a way for us to have a deeper understanding of what we might find? Well, absolutely. Like that's Absolutely. that's like the purpose of of all of these things is just to be yes. a to that. Okay. It's a map, it's a map of our internal experience. It's you know, the Abhidhamma thinks of itself as a Buddha's eye view of our experience of what's going on. And so the idea absolutely is that it provides fingers pointing at the moon of our at our experience. The value of a map, I mean the map is not the territory. So we, you know, this isn't a metaphysical claim that there is such a thing as restlessness. It's, there is, you know, let's look at this aspect of our experience that we call restlessness and study it. We can hold it in mind. We can learn to recognize it and not be swept away by it. That's the, that's the idea. That's the whole idea behind the Abhidhamma and behind the Buddha's teachings because really all the Buddhist teachings are included in here. So is this, is, th is that helpful? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I just, uh, my teachers um, suggested to me, have often suggested, because they're very steeped in the Abhidhamma, you know, about learning more about it. And, um, and that was my sense. But it, it, it always just kind of gets a little, uh, you know, I have to bring myself back to that because otherwise, yeah. it's, oh, my God, how, you know, what do I do? Oh, with these are, yeah, these are talking points. And the value of the map is is walking the territory. And so that's that's what we're trying to get at. In our own experience. Anything else before we we give ourselves. Um, 10 minutes here, five or 10 minutes. Everybody good? Let me just, let me, let me just quickly run over how, how these elements, well, no, I'll do the occasionals. I'll do the occasionals when we come back. So why don't we uh, take a break? I will ring a bell in, uh, oh, say somewhere between five and 10 minutes. Does that sound good? Maybe 22, we'll come back. All righty. Welcome back, everybody. Um, just to check in, does everybody, anybody have a question come up while you were away? Did your mind generate anything that said, what? <laughs> All righty. Oh, David, please. Yeah, I had two questions. Thank you. Um, is there a version of the Abhidhamma um, that you would recommend to non-scholars? And um, yes. second, oh, okay. And the, the second question is almost related to the previous question. Is this something that more or less necessitates having a teacher bring you through? Okay, the first question is I, I is uh, about where to where to go if you're interested in this, and I have a uh, a bibliography. It's a very short one, about I think five or just five or six items, and it lists 
uh, uh, some websites where you can go and uh, uh, I'll, I'll be bring, I'll bring this up at the end and we'll take a look at it and talk about what they what the elements are uh, and and uh, Rob said he would post it to the chat or um, send it to the to the registration list at the end. So there is that. Now the issue about a teacher, this is I think this is um, an important issue because, in my understanding, historically, the Abhidhamma was used as a teaching device by teachers with students. And so that's why when we in the West got a hold of the Dharma, we could we could relate to the suttas pretty easily. There are stories about the Buddha. We had, it took forever to get them translated into English, but now they're available um, in, in a number of different translations uh, and different languages. Um, but how to relate to a list, you know, without a teacher? What I've done is to, I, I have sat with people in contexts like this 20 years ago, I believe. Well, it was 22 years ago, Steve Armstrong was teaching uh, classes on the Abhidhamma to the Sati Center. And I, it was in 2001 because it was disrupted by 9-11. Um, those were in-person classes and uh, Steve, I understand, was taught by a, you know, by a, a teacher who taught him the Abhidhamma. There are people now who have written books about it. There are a couple of really nice ones. Um, actually, let me, uh, I'll just, I'll bring this up right now. I think, I think what we've got there is the, uh, it says engaging the Abhidhamma bibliography. So these, these are, you will get these. Um, I've used these kind of resources to work with these items myself. And of course, when I've been thinking about how to present the material here today, that's also been useful in getting me to engage these concepts to try to attain some clarity for myself. This first element here, Andy's uh, piece, was published by the Insight Journal. It's an absolutely fabulous summary. Um, it's a one page summary and then a bunch of lists. <laughs> the one page summary is great. Um, and then it's just lists. Uh, Karuna Dasa, this is a, a relatively recent book and it's, it's very, very rich. Uh, it's a thick book. I don't even know where it, where it is. Oh, there it is. It's, it's a nice big thick book. And um, the section on the Chittasakas that we're doing today is about maybe a quarter of the book. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very rich and excellent. Bhikkhu Bodhi uh, has had this out for some time, a comprehensive manual of Abhidhamma. Uh, I find it um, more obscure, but people, some people find it very helpful. Beth Jacobs, this book is a, um, It's a, a more conversational, less formal. Uh, the Karuna Dasa book is, is sort of old fashioned in its presentation, academic kind of. Beth Jacobs is more conversational, um, doesn't make an effort to try to uh, um, cover everything. The Anaponica Terra's uh, book is, is probably the uh, was most accessible for me, uh, just a d description of the Abhidhamma. And Jnana Taloka is, is really just an index. It's just a, um, you know, this book, this verse, this chapter, uh, uh, and all of the texts of the Abhidhamma can be found at Sutra, Sutta Central. If you guys haven't found suttacentral.net yet, um, an absolute a super valuable research source uh, contains translations of uh, all of the uh, Pali canon in, in not just English, but in other languages and not just one translation. 
and you can find line by line comparison. So it's a fabulous site and you can find the texts there. Sharon, please. Thank you. I just have a definitional question that I need help sure. with. Sati, you said, is always Carusola, uh, always wholesome. Yeah. However, a sniper has exceedingly high state of mindfulness. Uh -huh. Well, no, that's a, we'll talk about Sati in a little bit more clarity there. Sati involves metta, it involves caring. Because being aware of the present moment, what's present in the present moment is not just our sense, sensory material, we practice paying attention to the breath, but it also includes our intentions, it includes mindfulness of intentions, the present moment always includes an intention, Chetna is always present, Sankara always present, it also includes the feeling tone of the moment. So, and so a sniper has has focus and attention. Those are the universal uh, uh, chatasikas, but they can be unskillful if directed in ways that um, you know. When the object of attention is one that would <laughs> create harm, uh, sought you are not. There's the abandonment of hearing, of conscience. Hearing is always present with sati, otapa, present with sati. So there is a there is a distinction between sati and a manasakara, which was one of those um, universal, ethically neutral elements. So there's always manasakara. There can be one pointedness too. The sniper can be one pointed and maintain sustained attention. But those are those are neutral. Those elements are neutral because sustained attention can be on um, the suffering of others. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That helps me. Sure. Let me uh, let me let's return to the the wonderful realm of the um, unskillful factors. Is that up there for you? Yep. Yeah. So these are the unwholesome factors. These are the, the intentional, volitional impulses that arise. Not that we do, they happen. They arise in each mind moment. And our job is to become aware of them. So we've talked about the universals. These are always pr present in an unskillful mind moment. The absence of cognitive clarity, and delusion and the absence of ethical uh, clarity in the ahirika and anotapa. The A in front of hirika means no. So now we have a bunch of occasionals, what we call occasionals. These things like, like the occasional ethically neutral things, they arise individually and with others depending on the configuration of the particular unwholesome moment. So I'm going to go through them and um, talk, try to try to give you some sense of what each of them is, because there's so damn many of them. There will be a test at the end. Um, so let's start with lobha, the first one here. Whoops, that's what happens when you click on something. Um, lobha, which we translate as greed, and as I said, it's a it's a um, spectrum word that refers to a whole range of wishing and wanting and longing for, and there will be an object associated with it. We can study this in ourselves. If you bring to mind something you want, uh, and, you, and just allow your mind to pay attention not only to the thing you want, but the way you feel the wanting part, you know, there's something pleasant. We can study that, that's the, the idea here. So this is attachment here, greed. It's not just desire. Chanda is ethically neutral. So this is different from desire. So you can imagine your Dharma, 
your Ajahn in your monastery saying to you for the next week, come back and tell me the difference between Lopa and Chanda, between desire and greed. So explore your own experience. Dithi is, is also a, a uh, uh, it's, it's, it's translated as view. I think it's important to distinguish that we're talking about speculative views. These are, these are the cognitive part uh, of imagining things and believing they're real. view is also wrong view. Sometimes people qualify it by saying wrong view because there is samaditi would be right view and it's the first element of the Eightfold Path. But ditti speculative views, you know, the experience, what, what can we say about our experience ultimately? As the Buddha pointed out, it's impermanent insubstantial and unsatisfactory. And the fact of its unsatisfactoriness is be, it just is the way it is. Things are as they are. When we find them unsatisfactory, that's a projection of our own dissatisfaction, of our own dukkha. So these are the elements that are involved in dukkha. One of the, one of the, one of the sources of dukkha Sankara dukkha is the dukkha of storytelling. My wife calls it storytelling dukkha. We tell ourselves stories and then freak ourselves out with those stories. You know, there's a, there's a, a Zen, Zen story about the painter who's painting a picture of a tiger on a wall and he's painting it in such exquisite detail that when he steps back and looks at it, oh my gosh, it's a tiger, and he peels over. So we tell ourselves stories. This is ditti, speculative views. And of course, we fight over, you know, this is democracy. That's not democracy. This is right. That is wrong. Speculative views. And they're all built. What realities? Impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, emptiness, insubstantiality. There are no, another thing to note here is there are no agents here. Nobody is doing anything. These things are happening on their own. Attention arises and skillful attention formulates into perceptions and views. So speculative view, watch the things, you know, we all think we have a clue, right? But, but I've asked this question in, in a lot of contexts. So let me ask it here. Does anybody really know what's going on, what all this is about? You know, my, my uh, daughter posted on her uh, Facebook page once, the three stages of life, birth, what the fuck is this, and death. What is, you know, does anybody know? Put up your hand. We're all, it's a mystery. We don't know. And yet, we will fight over ideas about, you know, we will argue and dispute. The Buddha said, I teach a Dharma that doesn't dispute with anyone, that doesn't contend with anyone. And we, you know, these views that we attach to, these understandings, these stories, these narratives that we attach to, a source of suffering. Not that we don't use these maps, we use them. They're necessary for us to be able to navigate, but you know, we can be wrong about the terrain. Anyway, pay attention to what we think things are and the intensity of clinging that we can bring to our views about what's right. We really want to be right. And a story behind anger is I'm right and you're wrong, very frequently. So these speculative views that we cling to, mana, conceit. This is a notion that uh, it's a reflexive thing. It's one of the higher fetters, actually. 
um, it's 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 a reflex creation of self, and you know some of it is in language. Was it um, one of the twentieth century philosophers? Maybe it was Wittgenstein said uh, the self seems to be a grammatical error. You know, I want, I am, I'm cold, I think. You know, my car, my house, my ideas my body. These are all self forming, reflexive uh, actions, we can recognize in our own experience, right. And then there's then there's dosa, which is, you know, the the hatred is of the trio of greed, hatred and delusion. So it's, um, Ill will. It wants to push away what is unpleasant. It's it's a it it comes from the uh, uh, tanha, the underlying disposition to want things pleasant and to make pain go away. This is an evolutionary thing in us. Uh, what was raised in that earlier question? You know the the impulse to uh, keep on keeping on is an evolutionary value. The, the impulse to make pain go away, to deal with pain of evolutionary value. Um, but it also leads to disputes with the world, aversion to things in the world. We, you know, we say, what's wrong with the world? What's wrong here? What's wrong there? It's, it's a projection of our own dukkha. It's not about the world. The world is the way it is. We can see dosa in our own complaints. And I think a complaint is an incredible, incredibly good marker for dukkha because it's an explicit articulation of dissatisfaction, aversion. Let's take a look at, at, uh, at envy here. Envy is, um, it's a spectrum worm word as well, that covers, you know, mild wishing to jealousy and, and uh, um, it's a feeling of you know, why should they have that? They don't deserve that. I deserve that. Self is involved in this here. You can see how these things can arise in conjunction with each other some on their own and some not. Stinginess is particularly interesting. How would you distinguish Macharya from Lobha? Stinginess from greed. Now the Abhidhamma would have you introspect here and take a look in your own experience. How would you dispirit? You know, stinginess is uh, not wanting to share. There's a hoarding element to it. Anybody else have some? I mean, you, you, this, is, this is something where you can work on with a group. It suggests some, you know, that niggardliness. It's a kind of avarice. I think Andy translates it as avarice. Not wanting to, and it's, it's rooted in, there's a fear of loss. So, you know, if we can identify this in our experience, times when we felt this stinginess, when we drive by the person standing at the exit to the parking lot with the sign, What a great place to study our reactivity, what comes up. But when there's stinginess there, you know, the Buddha said, if you understood, you wouldn't, you would always share every meal with someone. Stinginess comes up with greed, comes up with speculative views. You can imagine ideas that have to do with 
government policy giving things to people they don't deserve. Stinginess, speculative views are rising. Kukucha, worry. A worry is, um, uh, it's, it's restlessness of the mind and in the hindrances, for those of you familiar with the, with the hindrances, Udacha and Kukucha, restlessness and worry are put together because worry is, you know, ruminating over, over the past and the future. How did I do? How will I be? How is that perceived? How am I going to do? How am I going to be perceived? What's it going to be like? Worry. It's a, there's restlessness with it. Um, we can recognize that. Anybody? No, never worried about something? <laughs> you know, it's, <clears throat> it's a common occurrence. And we have Tina, which is in the, in the hindrances, it's slumped together with Mita. Tina, Mita, and it's translated as sloth and torpor. And I always thought those were pretty awkward words. I never quite was at home with sloth and torpor. So I, I translate them in my own mind as laziness. Anybody ever felt lazy? Just that lazy. It's a mental condition. You know, something exciting appeared, all of a sudden, no problem, I've got the energy, but this is, you know, laziness, mita, fatigue, which is a mental fatigue, it's not the exhaustion after a day of working, but you know, it's, you can say to your, to your teenage kid, you say, ah, oh, they they clean your room and of course, oh, I'm so tired and da da da. Well, you want to go for, you want to go to a movie, you want to, oh yeah, great. The energy comes right there when the object uh, changes. So Tina and Mira are, they come together frequently enough to be lumped as a, uh, one, as a singular thing in the, in the, uh, in, as a hindrance. Um, But laziness and fatigue, we can recognize them in our experience One of the ways of, of dealing with them is, well, if it's physical fatigue in meditation, we're urged to stand and do our meditation standing. We can also bring our attention to something that generates interest and energy, which uh, these these don't always appear in uh, an unskillful in the among you know at, at an unskillful moment, but often. And then the last, which is which is really a biggie, vichikicha, which is uh, doubt. And we'll see that the first of the skillful factors, the first of the beautiful factors, is sada, which is faith. So I want to say something about this kind of doubt. Um, it's it's uh, not the kind of doubt, I mean, there are two kinds of doubt. First kind is like, I doubt that the moon is made of green cheese. I doubt it's an alien base. I doubt that um, all kinds of I don't believe. It's not the same thing as I don't believe. It's more like, I don't know what to believe. And the metaphor for it is uh, it's skeptical that it's it's every everything. Well, why this? Well, you know, you you tell your kid and they say, well, why that? And it's the infinitely regressive why. It's not knowing how to know. How do you know what you know? Vichy the the, the the metaphor is the donkey that is faced with a, a basket of corn and a basket of, I don't know, what, what else did donkeys eat, hey? And they, they look at the two of them and they don't know which to eat. And so they starve to death. So Vichikicha is, is a kind of doubt, it's skeptical doubt. It's one of the lower fetters. It's actually uh, a, a significant one that people seem to oppose to faith as blind faith. But how do you know? What you know? How do you how do you know? What's the difference between 
belief in a spec speculative view was was the Buddha a fully awakened being? You know, is that a is that a, a titi? Is that how do you know what to know? What about this rebirth stuff, reincarnation stuff, karma stuff? How do we know? The Buddha was would say, you know, you know your direct experience. So if you stub your toe, you know it hurts. Anybody not know it hurts? We all know it hurts. Dukkha is a an emergent reality. It's a direct experience of, of unpleasantness and pain that we react to. We react to with irritation, or we react to it with caring. But there's a response Vichikicha. What do we what do we know from our experience directly? And what do we, what are the speculative views that it gives rise to? And the Buddha would say that Vichikicha doubt, confusion about what what we know and how we know what we know, what we decide is true and what we decide is not, and how do we decide? You know, um, I've been told, and maybe you've heard as well by by senior teachers, that we need to uh, accept the the Pali Canon as it is, and not pick and choose among the things we want to believe and not believe. But there are places in there where you know the Buddha is born and takes seven steps with an umbrella held over his head and declares himself. I don't buy that. I'm sorry. 32 marks of the great man in the in the Majjhima Nikaya, you know, if you if you he has legs of a gazelle, it doesn't say whether it's front legs or back legs, but I'll tell you, I that has got to be metaphorical, be, otherwise I just don't buy it. Why? But what do you think? <laughs> you know, the marks of the great man, I think, is a metaphorical thing. So picking and choosing, how do you decide what aspects of the Dharma, of the teachings in the Pali Canon, how do you decide? Do you have a way to decide or do we just take it all? How do we know what we know? These are, these are matters of inquiry for ourselves. So these are the, these are the unwholesome factors. These articulate the second noble truth, the, the arising dukkha that, that, uh, that uh, we, can, we can put an end to through, through right view, through seeing things clearly. And this whole Abhidhamma project is an effort to see clearly and not be uh, you know, sandbagged by one of these elements that shows up and we, we don't recognize it, we don't know it, and it just sweeps us away. So let me just pause for a second and see if if uh, we have some questions about the un, unskillful factors before I um, before I Rosemary, please. You're muted. Yeah, just I was unmuting. So uh, here's where I I get attached to views here, and that is. When people talk about doubt as self-doubt, because to me, it more is worry or self-hatred or even conceit. And so I just wanted to see where you come down on that. Well, it depends on what the particular thing is that's going on. There can be, I mean, there self-doubt is feels like a funny phrase to me. Uh, I'm reminded of the uh, message that was written on the, the blackboard at IMS during an early retreat session. People came back from the walking session of the retreat to find somebody had written on the, on the blackboard, self-discovery is always bad news. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure about self doubt since self is essentially you know it's a it's a view 
Sakya Ditti is one of the lower fetters. Yep. It's the view that there is a substantial self. Doubt. You know? so, doubt. <laughs> so, you know, and conceit is in there. That, like, like I say, these factors arise, can arise, the occasionals can arise uh, individually or in collections with different intensities, depending on on the situation and the idea is to be to keep an eye out for them right yeah. any other any other thoughts about the or questions about the uh um unskillful qualities these are these are what we live with most of the time just just for us to know Alrighty. Oh, and, and this was identifying them as the hindrances here. So restlessness and worry. Lopa, which would be um, Kamachanda would be the desire for sensual experience. Dosa, ill will, Vyapada. And then Tina, Mita, together, and Vichikicha. So you have the five hindrances. These are all articulated in the Abhidhamma. Now we're going to look at the beautiful factors. There are more beautiful factors than there are uh, unskillful factors, but the unskillful factors speak with a louder voice, if you know what I mean. And there, there are more universal factors that arise. Look at the whole list here. So we're going to go through them because, well, sada. We start, well, let me just say this. People talk about how when sati is present, all the others fall into place. So if we can bring mindfulness to our daily activities, we practice our mindfulness. We cultivate uh, our ability to pay mindful attention during our meditation, but we want to bring this to our daily life because when sati is present, all the other beautiful factors arise. Mindfulness, you know, when we're taught, when we're taught look, um, mindfulness, uh, we start usually with bare attention. Mindfulness of the body, the first foundation of mindfulness. You know, and, and for me, for a long time, mindfulness was about body scans and following the breath and um, and we lose track of the fact that there are other kinds of mindfulness. In the early texts, the Buddha talks about uh, a kind of protective mindfulness, recognizing the wholesome and the unwholesome, recognizing them, you know, these elements as unskillful, as potentially harmful to ourselves and others to recognize that. That little story about the, the, the man trying to pick his way through a briar patch without getting stuck. You know, it's, a, it's, it's not just bare attention. It's attention and knowing. So there's this protective uh, recognition. Mindfulness also includes mindfulness of um, Vedana, pleasantness and unpleasantness. It's the second foundation of mindfulness is to notice that. But in my experience, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about mindfulness of Vedana, and yet it's really important. One of my close friends is a neuropsychiatrist, and he says, you know, the neurology, a bunch of neurons here, uh, the neurology and here, the neurology of liking, I mean, of pleasant and wanting, and of unpleasant and not wanting, those neurons are embedded in each other so that when one likes, one wants, it happens automatically. Pleasant and unpleasant are important to keep track of. And, and it's a, a very short portion of the, of the, uh, the suttas. Uh, just a paragraph. One is aware when things are pleasant, one is aware when things are unpleasant in body and in mind. 
But if you use the Vedana meter, it's a very, it's, it's a really useful practice because you'll find yourself liking the pleasant and not liking the unpleasant and studying that response to almost anything you can bring in, to bring to mind, any moment, any person, any thought, any story, any physical sensation. So sati includes our internal mind states as well. The third foundation of mindfulness is recognition of, of lust when it's present and when it's absent. That would be lopa, desire. When desire is present and when it's absent. When dosa is present and when it's absent. When delusion is present. So, so the Buddha and the foundations of mindfulness is pointing at, pointing us at these kinds of qualities that we're looking at in the Abhidhamma. And then, of course, there's, there's the situation where the Buddha encourages us to imagine something and, and uh, reflect on our reaction to it. In the, in the first foundation, he talks about um, imagining our internal organs. You know, there's probably internal organs that I don't know about, that I can't imagine. I don't really know what a spleen looks like, but he does mention the spleen. I, what can I say? But intentionally creating concepts and responding, watching ourselves respond to them, a very powerful mindfulness practice, something that we, that we can use in the, in the Abhidhamma. But we can use it as, uh, I've, I've, I've uh, friends who teach it as a, a meta practice as a mindfulness practice so that you would establish yourself in a mindful disposition and then bring to mind uh, someone towards whom you would try to generate friendly kind feelings and you know Sharon Salzberg says mindfulness the power of the power of, of metta is so great that it will bring to mind everything that stands in its way. So we can we can study our responses to things. Ajahn Amaro once gave a, uh, I, I heard him give this teaching a couple of times. You, you know, you you find yourself, as it says in the in the sutta, with bringing mindfulness to the front, just establishing yourself comfortably in mindfulness, and then bring to mind an idea and watch the resonance maintain mindful and, and both times that he did this he he brought up the idea of mother so you conjure the idea of mother and watch what happens in your mind as a mindfulness project so sati includes a lot more than just mindfulness of the breathing <clears throat> excuse me and mindfulness of 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 uh, physical sensations. And the fourth foundation is really where the Abhidhamma is, mindfulness of dhammas. And this is just an incredibly articulated map of the dhammas that we should be attentive to in terms of the fourth foundation. Sada is the opposite of Vichikicha. Sada is the first of the universal elements. There's a, so when Sati arises, Sada is present. Watch. When you find yourself sitting in mindfulness, look for look for Sada. Now faith isn't, you know, belief in a proposition. It's confidence. It also tra is translated as confidence. It's just knowing. It's 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 you it can be something simple like knowing that your foot is sore or that knowing that you don't know something i may not know whether reincarnation is true or not rebirth is true or not but i know for certain that i don't know i understand but i don't know so sada i have faith in my confusion you recognize directly 
So sada is, arises with sati. And also these, this is so important, the ethical elements too, piri and otapa, which moral shame and moral dread, this, I, I haven't changed this. It's, it's lack of consideration, fear of wrong. Well, yeah, there's sanctions for, for uh, violating social norms, laws. You know, Otapa, um, I don't know whether I, I mentioned this before, but Otapa and Hiri can, they don't necessarily stand in harmony. There can be a tension. So when the social norms are that you uh, submit yourself to a military draft, Hiri might find uh, there might be a tension there between our conscience, the tender conscience, and the even the fear of social sanction, fear of wrong. Wrong in this case has got to mean social sanction. This is somebody else's language. I haven't made it all my own yet. But fear of wrong, this is lack of consideration. And yeah, there's some, sometimes we, we follow social custom out of fear of being criticized, punished, wrong. Wrong and right are not what the Buddha had in mind. Dukkha and the end of Dukkha um, is what the Buddha was concerned about. So we have both the cognitive skillful factor and the ethical skillful factor, and they all rise together. Delusion is not present here. Worry and restlessness not present here. Right? Alobha, the absence of greed. You know, sometimes you could see this as generosity, but it's the absence of lobha. In the presence, alobha, how does this feel? How does alobha feel? Generosity. This would be, you know, third foundation of mindfulness stuff. Adosa, non-hatred. That's, you know, in this case, uh, an intention could arise of antagonism and ill will but you don't take the ride. Adosa. This is also metta in a way, because in the absence of aversion, what is, what is the manifestation? When one, is, when one is balancing an equanimity, equanimity is the next one. When one is balancing an equanimity, um, one isn't swept away by, by um, an arising aversion. This tetramaja tata is um, the stand-in for equanimity. We don't. The Abhidhamma doesn't use the word upeka here because apparently, my understanding, not a Pali student, but I've listened to Pali students. <laughs> and and the explanation I've been given for this is that um, there the the distinction between indifference and equanimity is not fully clear in the word upeka. But the tatramajatata means by the middle way. And so this is this is the equanimity. This 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 is part. This is uh, also present. When, when sati is present, sati recognizes kusala and akusala. Equanimity is not a state, it's a skill. It's like nirvana is a skill, something to learn. It's the learning how to not jump on 
the aversion bandwagon when something arises that we don't like and how not to grasp at what's pleasant. Um, we have mudita over here among the occasionals, appreciative joy. We see that we can see the um, the Brahma Viharas here in the the beautiful factors. You know, so we have equanimity, which would be tatramaja tata, mudita, karuna, and non hatred, which would be which would be the stand-in for metta. The absence of hatred, what's present? A, a friendly disposition, metta. We'll talk about these in a bit, but, but you can see the, the Brahma Viharas are present in the beautiful factors. And here we have uh, equanimity, which is dynamic. Like I say it's a, it's a balancing thing. It's not a permanent state, it's a skill, and as a skill, it's something that we can practice. It's um, a neutrality of mind. Uh, it's the middle way. Um, it's, it's engaged. It's not indifferent. It's engaged. It engages pleasant and unpleasant both. It and and it cares or caring is happening Yuri and otapa metta these are always present when sati is present now these next occasionals are interesting because they they come two at a time they come with body and mind and they really you know these aren't separate from sati. They're qualities of sati in a way, um, but they're articulated here so that we can notice them and distinguish them in our experience when they appear. Pasadi, tranquility. This is just simply quietness, tranquility of body, tranquility of mind. Um, it's the relax relaxation of tension in the body and mind. Both body and mind, there's not separation here. It's the ease. Lahuta is lightness. And um, it's a it's a quality of uh, I, I describe it as as lightness. Um, it's also described as agility. It's the absence of tinamita. It's the absence of sloth and torpor. It's light. You know, we can recollect times of lightness and times of lethargy. This is the opposite of lethargy. It's the, the uplift, the momentary uplift. When you feel unburdened. And agile, can move around, not constrained, lightness. Muruta, which is translated here as adaptability but it but it's also softness so it's malleable it means mindfulness is not rigid it's adaptable kabanyata ready to go this is you know ready to go is what i wrote it's i think uh Andy translates it as malleability, um, adaptability, workability. It's again, it's not rigid. My, and these are qualities of mindfulness, not not rigid. Pagunyata uh, is is pretty interesting. It's uh, 
it's healthiness, sometimes vigor. It's just the alertness, the healthy alertness of a mindful moment. The absence of mental disability, not hindered by worry. You know, you can see how any of the unskillful qualities that come in here are going to disrupt all this. There's no worry here. In the last of these Ujukata, rectitude. It's defined as rectitude, um, uprightness. I've, I find it an interesting quality because I think when we recognize injustice, it's coming out of here. It's the, the disposition of being straightforward and you know, honest in our presentation. That doesn't mean transparent necessarily. What are your deepest secrets? I'm not going to say. There's an honestness, an uprightness, a recognition. It recognizes lying and deceit in ourselves. Are we able to do that? So these universals are always present when sati is present. And so the cultivation of mindfulness is, is at the heart of, of cultivating um, the kusala factors. Gail, I see your hand, but I don't see your face. Uh-oh, Gail raised her hand and took herself offline. You're muted, go. No, you're muted still, Gail. All right, is it okay now? Yep. Okay, um, so I, I didn't, I like very much how you characterize these last six as being sort of the body and mind expression of a related concept. And so I tried to attach body and mind to them, and I got a little bit in the weeds. Um, so uh, I think, well, so I just want to check with you and then ask about one pair. For me, muduta, I said, was mind, and uh, kamanyata is body. Oh, no, they're both body and mind. Body they're and both mind. body and mind. Each one, they're right. So understood. If you look at, I'm sorry, that I, I was hoping that was clear. So if you look at Andy's list, you'll see that uh, Pasadi is, um, uh, which, what number is it? It's about 38. Uh, Kamanyata is 38 and 39, I believe. Maybe not, but they're, they're, they're two separate ones, but it's adaptability of body and of mind. And, and, and the, 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 the ready to go is uh, just like the pause before, ready to go, body yeah, and I, mind both. I understand. It's just I was trying to fit them into something yeah. that they didn't fit into. So yeah. sorry for the interruption. <laughs> These are, no, that's not an interruption. I appreciate questions because I, I've got to believe people are puzzled over this or that. This is, there's just so much material here. Um, so I appreciate you're putting your hand up there to clarify. Um, and so anybody else, you should put your hand down now, Gail, there you go. Um, so anybody else who has a question, please feel free to, uh, to put your hand up. Let's look at the occasionals and, and go through the occasionals here. Samavacha, which is right speech. Samakam. Kamanata, Sama Ajiva, right speech, right action, right livelihood. We recognize these immediately from the Eightfold Path. These are the sila elements, the behavioral elements, and in my view, these are the goals of our practice, right? Life, living life, and Sama, which we translate as right, <clears throat> is, uh, is, a, is a term that has its context in the fourth noble truth. 
the fourth noble truth is the path of uh, awakened living. And some, some people think it's the path to awakened living, the path to nirvana, but I, 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 uh, I understand it as the path of nirvana, of, of living right view, right understanding, and right speech, action, livelihood. Those are the speech, the forms of speech, the forms of action, and the forms of livelihood that don't make things worse, that don't add more dukkha into the mix, because we got plenty with that first noble truth. The third truth, remember, is that the cessation of tanha and upadana, the cessation of the akusala factors is possible. And that the cessation of the akusala factors with right understanding brings the kusala factors into play. Right speech, you know, usually it's defined um, as in terms of negatives. It's, def it's defined as not, not harsh, um, not divisive, not false, not idle. Um, but you can also you can also articulate it in in a positive way. This is from this from the Sutta Nipata. The Buddha says, "May we utter only such words as do not cause ourselves anguish and would not cause harm to others. These indeed are words well uttered." So this is a positive way of framing right speech as opposed to all of the negatives. May we speak only loving words, those words which make people happy, which carry no evil intent and speak lovingly to others. So verses from the Sutta Napata, before we got right speech is timely, true, uh, kind, and um, what is the fourth one? The words uttered by the Buddha, reaching safety, nibbana, and making an end of suffering, these are the very best of words. So that's, you know, right speech is a positive thing. It's not just the absence of, um, and right action, right action, appropriate action, action that does not add more dukkha to the mix. You know, usually it's described as or articulated in terms of the precepts. One shouldn't kill, one shouldn't steal, one shouldn't engage in harmful sexual behavior, one shouldn't lie, and then, oh my gosh, um, one shouldn't avail oneself of drugs and alcohol that lead to silliness. Um, that fifth one is is odd. Lee Brasington likes to point out that uh, originally that fifth precept was not to walk on seeds, because the four the first four are were ambient in the culture at the time. But you know when the, the Buddha would walk from place to place with an entourage, the monks would sometimes walk over farm farmers' uh, patties and disrupt their their growing, and so that would lead to complaints. So the fifth precept was not to walk on seeds, but it evolved to become no drugs or alcohol. But these are rules. They're described as rules, prohibitions. You know, and and rule-based ethics always fail because of context. You know, uh, don't speak falsely when the Nazis ask you if Anne Frank is there at home. I think you lie as best you can. I mean, you could try the Bill Clinton line, which was, what do you mean by is? But didn't, didn't work out so well for him. Um, probably you just you do better to just lie as best you can. Um, not to take what's not freely given. What about a gun from a child? Car keys from someone who's drunk. What's the ethical thing to do there? What is the point if you saw Adam Lanza walking into that school with all of his weapons? 
and you had the ability to bring him down. Hit him with all the loving kindness you can in the interest of putting an end to dukkha. So in my view, the, the precepts are guidelines for attending to our task of attenuating dukkha, putting an end to suffering. And so it's not right or wrong. It's a situationally dependent call, right speech, right action. What is the action here that attenuates suffering? Kindness, actually. Karuna, compassion. Another one of the occasions, these things don't all arise. They arise occasionally, sometimes in combination and in different intensities. Karuna, compassion, caring. It's a kind of, it's an extension of metta. It's an extension of kindness and caring friendliness. And it's the alternative response to unpleasant experience and pain. It's the alternative response to dosa, the alternative response to aversion and anger, irritation and frustration. We might respond the same way if the jackhammer starts pounding outside your window, you might close the window out of compassion for yourself. Or you can close it out of anger at the people with the jackhammer. But the window gets closed, your mental state is different. Amudita is, is an interesting concept because it's, it's tricky, uh, because it really is, it's, it's appreciative joy. We're taught, I've been taught for years and thought of it for years as sympathetic joy, joy and the joy of others. And for me, the model of that is my friend Martha, who is gone now, but she was a, a Dharma practitioner. Some of you may have known her, and she was blind. And she recalled an experience where she was walking with a friend one evening, and the friend started talking about the sunset, which was just amazing, the cloud formations and the crepuscular rays and the colors in the sky and the setting of, and of course Martha couldn't see any of it, but she could experience her friend's joy. And that experience of joy in the pleasantness, mudita, the joy in the joy of others. But I actually think it, it expands a little more and, and you might be able to, you know, I mean, you can, take this or leave it. It's my, my interpretation, because mudita as appreciative joy means it's also recognizing our own pleasantness and appreciating the pleasantness without clinging. But, you know, as the Buddha said, going through that thorn bush where the, the, the thorns are pleasant experience, you got to be careful not to be stuck by them and to cling. So mudita, but this would be the alternative response to grasping. It would be appreciating the pleasant without grasping or clinging to it. So these would be the, the, um, the uh, Brahma Viharas. I think I, I think I had a slide that said, yeah, so Sati, possibly. I don't know what those are. That's an interesting slide. I'm not quite sure. One of the, one of the things to do is to go through these lists and see the relationships between things. I'm not sure what I had in mind. So there you go. There we go. That's the, uh, the Brahma Viharas. Amanda, you've got a question, please. Uh, hi, that that was quite amusing there. Um, um, I have a question about something that I have not heard you mention, so I really wasn't sure the right time to bring it up, but it's on the slide. Um, I noticed at the top there that you're translating this as wholesome slash beautiful factors. And I uh, recently 
heard a wonderful talk from Gil about um, uh, beauty being a connotation of the word Kalyana and how awkward that can be for English speakers, because for us, good is good and beauty is beauty. <laughs> beautiful is beautiful. They're, they're, they could be very different things. So I, what I was curious about is what is the poly word here that you're translating as both wholesome and beautiful? Okay, kusala is the word. And okay. it's translated as it's it's translated into English traditionally as beautiful factors, but they are the wholesome factors. They're the kusala factors. They're the factors that lead to the cessation of dukkha rather than to its enhancement, the akusala factors. So yeah. that's it's, it's kusala, that word is what we're translating. That's interesting. So it's it's sort of primarily beautiful but clearly has a connotation of skillful has has a lot of those connotations and beautiful is certainly how we respond to it okay interesting we love we love these things don't we <laughs> yeah we really we really would like more of them yeah yeah so Thank you. Adosa, so these are the brahma viharas and you can see that the the articulation here is more granular than just that. There's more more material here, and then panya, which is wisdom, which is um, uh, trend. I would translate as penetrating insight. It's not like an ocean of I don't know ocean of all knowing all seeing all you know it's a it's a it's a uh, an insight uh condition uh, panya mm -hmm. the insight the insight and of course it's sometimes present and not, sometimes not all of these all of the occasionals and you can see how they might occur in 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 conjunction And they might appear with each other, they might appear separately. So, um, hmm. you know, I would say one other thing I'd say about Panya is it's an activity. It's something we do, it's a verb. Um, the absence of delusion doesn't necessarily mean Panya, wisdom doesn't mean wisdom. It arises probably out of all of these factors acting synergistically. It's a it's a rarity. It's a moment of profound understanding. So here we go. The Abhidhamma. Gail, you've got another question, or did you just put your hand in? Please. Uh, I think it just came up that the occasionals are conditional. They, they arise from circumstances. And the universals, uh, conceptually, it means it's possible for them to all uh, be present at the same time. They all arise. They're all present at the same time. And, I mean, that's just the way you look at the world, and I'm just imagining what it would be like to look at the world with all of those things present at when the same sanya time. when sanya is when sati is present when sati is truly present and we can experience that when we're when we're sitting all those things are present the occasionals depend on conditions right but of course the these others all depend depend on sati you can also cultivate not just sati, but look at ca cultivating hiri and otapa, a particular attention to the to the ethical dimension, the sensitivity we have in our our own re recognition to to suffering, and to and to to uh, the response of kindness. Josh, Josh, do you have a, a you've got a question? We we can we can move to questions here. I I can put this. Yeah. Yes, just a brief. Thanks for doing this. Just a brief. Um, I don't know if it's a rhetorical question on your part to to answer or, um, you know, these 
these things in the suttas where they seem fantastical or things like that, and this notion of believing or disbelieving, I just I made a comment in the chat, just, I just don't see where, especially if we were looking for things that are truthful, where there's a requirement to believe or disbelieve anything, you know, we can just take it as information until we can verify it for ourselves. You know, I didn't live all this time ago. Our life has changed so much, even within a hundred years. So to me, a lot of things about life could be potentially unimaginable for us, you know, when we talk about all these really old time periods. So the short answer is, I, you know, there, it's just information. I don't need to believe it or disbelieve it. These fantastical Correct. things. Yeah. You know, the belief, disbelief pretty much for me narrows down to impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and insubstantiality, emptiness. You know, other things, speculative views, some of them are useful, some of them are not. People will go to war over and people will call you wrong, you know, and you should believe and you shouldn't believe. And those are, but you know, if you've seen for yourself how acting out of anger is painful well you stop doing it because we're not stupid slow maybe but we're not stupid we won't hurt ourselves on purpose we do it because we think you know our default responses the other quick point was um it seems recently uh, there's more emphasis on pleasant unpleasant and that's the ones that are easy to connect to but uh it's also there's also neither pleasant nor unpleasant and yes you know that's so so that's something to explore using the vedana meter try to find something that is neither pleasant nor unpleasant that's actually zero on that scale from minus 10 to plus 10 and i find that what the closer i pay attention to something uh you know i can get down maybe not to tenths of a point but i can get down to uh to noticing, is there really some pleasantness? Is there pleasantness to neutrality? Maybe it's, it's, you yeah, know. this is where our perception comes in. That's, you know, when perception becomes more malleable, then it becomes kind of an interpretation or how we want to interpret it. And, you know, how much can we quantify it and how much can't we at a certain point as well? Well, the Vedana meter is an effort to try to articulate for ourselves feeling tone, that second factor of awakening, the second factor of mindfulness. You know, all these teachings are, are, are integrated. You know, the, the, the four foundations of mindfulness have to do with the, with the skandhas. Kate, you've got, you've got your hand up, please. You're, you're muted. Yeah. I just, the comment on that, it sort of seems like if we bring mindfulness, if mindfulness arises and we're looking at Vedana, mindfulness itself is pleasant, sort of, you know? So it kind of adds a pleasant, it, it's like if I think of something as being negative, but then mindfulness is really strong, it doesn't seem so negative anymore. It depends on the thing. Mindfulness may be pleasant, but a present moment may be an unpleasant moment. Right. It just seems like it always mitigates it a little bit. My, well, what it does is it works against us making things worse. Yeah. Okay. Right. No second arrow. Yeah. Right. No second arrow. Vanessa? Hi. Um, about the neither painful nor pleasant feeling, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could say something about um, what something I read about it. It says neither neither painful nor pleasant feeling is pleasant in virtue of knowledge and painful in virtue of want of knowledge. Hmm. Interesting. Well, <laughs> there are all kinds of ideas out there. Pleasant, neither pleasant nor unpleasant seems to me to be perhaps a point on a line. And so actually experiencing neither pleasant nor unpleasant is not a broad swath of experience that's neither pleasant nor unpleasant if you bring your attention to it, in my experience. Now you may find 
that you bring your experience to, you know, a, a part of a sidewalk and you find it neither pleasant nor unpleasant. But if you start looking more at your experience, you'll notice the textures of the sidewalk. It's bright. Maybe it's uncomfortable for your eyes. Maybe you notice stuff on the sidewalk that makes you cringe. You know, pleasant and unpleasant are constantly changing. And that's why equanimity, tatra macha tata, is a balancing act. It's a skill to develop. And we may not be able to do it as well as we can later on. Uh, we practice cultivating Nibbana by cultivating the kusala factors, the skillful factors. And for me, I find Hiri and Otapa uh, really helpful guides. Look for opportunities to be kind. You know, we can practice not just trying to bring mindfulness to the moment as we as we encounter a, a homeless person, but look for opportunities to be kind. And maybe it only means just greeting them if they're trying to greet you. But watch the quality of our heart. I find that mindfulness of, of that uh, a, a helpful a helpful tool for cultivating these factors, both the cognitive and the ethical dimensions. And sati is aware of kusala and akusala. It's that protective awareness. It's not just mindfulness of the breathing. I ramble on. Any last questions? This has been a, a rush through, like I say, a trailer. There, um, if you look at Andy's charts, you'll see he has a number of different things. You can ex explore rupa more. You can explore the mind processes, uh, how mind moments progress. Uh, there's a huge amount of material here, unexplored largely. So it's an opportunity for you to get in there and dig around and, you know, see what you find. Uh, I recommend those books and uh, and and the links, Andy's link and the and the and the and, the, and Suda Central, uh, uh, the Nana. Um, on a, the book on the Theravadan Abhidhamma is really excellent. So there we go. We're closing it on 12. Rob, do you have?